Well, good morning. good morning. Are you happy to be here? Yes. I hope so. Um, some of you need to tell your face. That's a little better. Okay. You know, I'd rather be here than the finest jail in Franklin County, wouldn't you? <laughs> Amen. My name's Christian Becker. My wife, Marion, is here with me. Uh, we have four adult children. We have nine grandchildren spread out around the country a little bit. And... Uh, I've been in ministry for 50 years. Most recently, I was at Lakeland Church of the Brethren up in Manita. And um, I've had a career in retail management, sales, uh, telemarketing, manufacturing, a whole bunch of different things. But uh, now, I'm a teacher. Uh, I've taught world history, uh, and I'm now the permanent sub at a large high school up in Botata County. Pray for me. We have amazing opportunities uh, in the high school to make a difference for eternity. It's also like being a grandpa to a thousand kids. So it's not too bad. I enjoy it. Let me ask you, how many of you were raised in a Christian home? How many of you were raised in a Christian home? Okay, interesting. Okay, good. Um, how many of you came to Christ through a friend? Anybody come to Christ through a friend? No? How many of you would not raise your hand no matter what I said? <laughs> this is not a Pentecostal church, right? <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, I get an annual physical. I got one coming up in a month. Maybe you get one too. Today, I want to do a spiritual with you. Have you ever had a spiritual done? Now, normally a doctor takes about an hour to do a physical. I want you to give me thirty minutes. Can you do that? Okay, thirty minutes for a spiritual. Let me ask you this: What kind of faith do you have? That's the question we're going to think about today. What kind of faith do you have? But before we turn to the Word of God, uh, I want to. Take a minute with you and let's talk again to the God of the Word. Would you join me in prayer? Our Father God, you've heard our praises and our prayers, and now we need a word from you. Please speak to us today through your holy word, the Bible. Give us ears to hear. Teach us something new. Encourage us. Remind us of what we know and need to obey. Show us Jesus. We ask in the name of our Savior and Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. Did you ever wear hand-me-down clothes? You ever wear hand-me-down clothes? Uh, as a boy, I liked them, you know, second-hand clothes, because they were new to me. I had an older brother, so it was kind of natural. I got hand-me-downs. And I liked them. They were, they were new to me. Uh, they didn't bother me. And, and you know what? Many Christians wear a hand-me-down faith. Did you ever think about that? A second-hand faith to you. Here's how it happens. Uh, people say, well, uh, my parents and grandparents were Christians. I believe in God, I go to church, I pray, I'm a Christian. And you might be thinking, right, what's wrong with that? Everything is wrong with that. Many Jews in Jesus' day thought the same way. They had the one true God, Jehovah, they had Moses, they had the prophets, they had the temple, and they were proud of it. And then they met John the Baptist. John the Baptist, you remember him? If you'd like, you can begin turning your Bible to Luke chapter 3. If you have the King James Pew Bible, it's on page 752. John the Baptist was the Billy Graham of his day. You remember Billy Graham? Most of us here look like we're old enough to remember Billy Graham. He died in 2018 at 99 years old. Uh, maybe you had the privilege of attending a crusade. I did when I was a little boy, too. And then in 2003, we had his son Franklin come to Roanoke for, uh, they didn't call it a crusade, they called it a festival, Southwest Virginia Festival. Or maybe you've been to revival meetings at church. And you know, just like today, even the good religious people back then went to hear the evangelist, John the Baptist. Let's look at what John says to them. Luke chapter 3, I want to verse 7 to 8. And today I'm going to use the King James Version. Luke 3, verse 7. Then he said to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The Jews in Jesus' day thought that being Abraham's children, their Jewishness, that was good enough for God. But John said that true faith produces, do you see what he said it produces? Fruits. It produced fruits in our lives that's worthy of, that's in keeping with 
repentance. What's repentance? Repentance is turning away from our sin and turning to God. And John said that's going to produce results in your life. There's going to be fruits. Do you agree with that? This is a brethren church. You can say amen. Okay. Amen. All right. You know, Jesus ran into the same problem that John did. He said the same thing. He said, if you were Abraham's children in John chapter 8, he said, you would do the works of Abraham. So Jesus considered the patriarch Abraham as the standard of faith, the measure of what real faith really was. He was the example for us to follow. And the Bible says that Abraham was not justified. He wasn't made righteous by what he did. It says, consider Abraham. He believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He was declared righteous as sins were forgiven because of his faith. In other words, Abraham believed God, he trusted God, and he acted accordingly. And that's always the standard of faith. Believe, trust, obey. Say that with me. Believe, trust, obey. Folks, listen, the issue of faith is not so much whether we believe in God, but whether we believe the God that we say we believe in. Do you believe the God that you say you believe in? Jesus said that the last judgment, many will say, Lord, Lord, we preached in your name, but he will say, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. That is the scariest verse in the Bible for preachers, folks. To think that there are people that be proclaiming the gospel, but they're not Christians. Later he said, you will see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. Now remember, he was talking to Jews, believers, right? That would kind of be like me telling you, when you die, you'll see Billy Graham, Franklin Graham, the district executive minister in heaven, but you're not going to be there. (laughs) How would that make you feel? How do you think the Jews felt when they heard that? They were not happy. Folks, listen to me, churchiness will not save you and me from our sin any more than Jewishness could save the Jews. Amen? Churchiness won't save you. But I have good news. Today, you can know that you have real faith, first-hand faith, effective faith, not just a second-hand faith. Real faith is more than agreeing with someone else's beliefs. Remember this, second-hand faith isn't real faith at all. So today, I want to use some props here. I have three chairs, and we're going to set these up over here, and they're going to represent three different kinds of faith, okay? We have the first chair of faith, we have the second chair of faith, and over here, we're going to have the third chair of faith, okay? First, second, third chair of faith, all right? Now, for first-hand faith, you must personally trust in God. That's what it means to sit in the first chair of faith. You must believe and trust in him personally. Abram, the Bible says, believe God. He had first-hand faith, real faith. He sat in the first chair of faith. Now, Abram knew about God, okay? He believed in God, but one day he realized that God was talking to him. And that he needed to trust God personally. Now, God's message was unusual. Listen to what he said. Leave your home country and go to a land I will show you. Abraham wasn't sure where he was going, but he trusted God. Now, how do we know that? Because he obeyed. There's no excuses recorded. He obeyed. Now, Abraham was a nomad. Uh, Now, car people, you just thought Chevy. (laughs) Okay, no. Nomads versus farmers. Nomads wandered around. They took their flocks with them. They lived in tents. Farmers would build a house. They'd plant crops. They might have cattle or other flocks as well, but they were in one place. Abram was a nomad. Now, when he arrived in Canaan, today's Israel, the first thing the Bible says he did was set up an altar and worship God. And then he pitched his tent. What does that tell you? What came first in his life? Not a trick question. His faith. God came first in his life, set up the altar first, then he pitched his tent. His relationship with God was based on real trust. And Abraham had both feet firmly planted in the kingdom of heaven. But Abraham had no son to inherit all that God had blessed him with. So when he was 80 years old, God promised him a son. It says, Abraham believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. 
Folks, that's faith. 80 years old. God's going to give him a son. Well, finally, after 20 years, Isaac was born. Abram was 100 years old. Okay? Now, Isaac learned about God from his father. He experienced God, but he experienced it through his father's faith. Do you see that? He had a second-hand faith. He sat in the second chair of faith. Now, one day, God tested Abraham, and he told him to take his son Isaac and offer him as a sacrifice. And if you've grown up in church, you've heard the story. And the Bible says, Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abram, Abram, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Now Isaac cooperated because he trusted his father. But Isaac, he was delivered through his father's faith. Do you see that? It wasn't his faith, it was his father's faith that delivered him. Because he had a second-hand faith, Isaac felt the pull of the world. He had, as it were, one foot in God's kingdom and one foot in the world. Now Isaac's crisis of faith came like it does for many sons when his father died, Abraham. Would Isaac sit in the first chair, have a first-hand personal faith relationship with God? Now you might remember Isaac's wife, Rebekah, she was barren, the Bible says. So, like his father, Isaac went to God in prayer. And he poured out his heart to God and pled with God for his wife, Rebecca, that she would have children. And the Lord answered with twin boys. You remember their names? Esau and Jacob. Not a trick question. Esau and Jacob. But when Isaac moved, sometimes he pitched his tent, dug a well, and then built an altar. What does that tell you? God didn't always come first, did he? Or sometimes it says he didn't build any altar. Sometimes Isaac struggled to trust God. Now Isaac's sons Jacob fathered his father's faith. But Jacob was in the third chair. Jacob had both feet in the world. He had a third-hand faith. God was... His grandfather is God, like a lot of people today. Just like some Christians. Now, Jacob was a deceiver. Okay? He was a con man. He looked out for number one. And even though he wasn't entitled to it, he schemed with his mother to steal the blessing of the firstborn from Esau, his brother. you remember that? Then what happened? Well, Jacob had to run for his life. And he went to live with his uncle Laban, far away. Now one day, God met with him in a dream, and he gave Jacob the opportunity to sit in the first chair of faith. What would Jacob do? What would you have done? Well, it says that he was afraid, and he promised God, listen to this, that he would serve him someday if things turned out all right. Really, you can read about it yourself in Genesis 28. Someday, if everything works out, I'll serve you. After Jacob arrived at his uncle's, he continued scheming. They tried to outsmart each other instead of trusting God. And Lord willing, next week we'll talk a little bit about, more about that when I preach on the girl that nobody loved. I hope you'll come. But back to the present. When Jacob's wife Rachel was childless, instead of turning to God like his father and grandfather did, Jacob gets angry. And he lets his wife call all the shots. And if you want to see the result, a completely dysfunctional family, read Genesis chapter 30. So Jacob schemes his way through life. And then he has to flee again to save himself. When Jacob comes to a new place, what will he do? Abraham built an altar, pitched his tent. Isaac pitched a tent and then built his altar. Isaac gets to a new place. He doesn't even think about building an altar. But when Jacob thinks that Esau is coming to kill him, then he calls out to his father and his grandfather's God to save him. What will happen? The Bible says that God meets with Jacob. You want to talk about grace. We have a gracious God, folks. 
And Jacob has a tremendous personal struggle, a crisis of faith, and he comes out believing and trusting in God. And he grabs hold of God's messenger and he says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. He decides to believe the God that he believed in. You want proof? The Bible says that Jacob gets rid of every pagan idol in his home and he builds an altar to Jehovah God. For the first time in his life, he puts God first. He decided to believe the God he believed in. And the Bible records that from then on, God refers to himself as the God of who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Boy, do we have a gracious, merciful God, don't we, folks? So remember, a second or third hand faith is not real faith. Relying on someone else's faith in God is not the same as knowing and trusting and believing in God personally. When you meet Jesus in the Bible, folks, and you realize that he is the Son of God, he's the one who died on the cross in your place and mine for our sin. Brother, sister, when you realize he rose from the dead to save you, it changes your life, doesn't it? As a brother in church, folks, you can say amen there. It changes your life. It changed my life. You know, it's a good question to ask a person. When you met Jesus, how did it change your life? Because he changes you, doesn't he? The Bible says the devils believe in God and they tremble. They're believers, but they're not saved. They're going to hell, the Bible says. And so are some people who claim to be Christians, but they've never been born again because they have a second or a third hand faith. They've never trusted in Christ. He's not their Lord. They have, like Jacob did, they have both feet in the world. Right? Both feet in the world. So will you put your faith in Christ? The Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently, earnestly seek him. So which chair are you in today? When you came in today, which chair were you in? I challenge you to move to the first chair of faith because second-hand faith, third-hand faith are not real faith, folks. Will you believe the God you believe in? Will you believe him enough to get rid of the idols in your life, the things that take God's place? Will you believe him enough to obey him in love? Let me tell you my story for a moment. My father, John Henry Becker Jr., attended a very liberal church. He lived in the world as a young man. He played a hot saxophone in a Chicago dance band back when jazz was all the rage. And let me tell you, Johnny Becker could play it. But a friend led him to Christ, and his life changed. He personally trusted Christ. He no longer wanted to play the world's music and live in the world. He wanted to use his talent for the Lord Jesus Christ. So after World War II, he decided to go to Bible college and did full-time ministry. And at Bible college, he met my mother. Get this, her name was Faith. Isn't that a great name for a pastor's wife? Faith. He became a pastor, a brother, an evangelist. And then when I was born, I lived in a home full of faith in God. Dad and mom were church planters. They started churches all across America. And I didn't know it, but we were dirt poor. I remember bags of groceries, secondhand clothes, showing up on our doorstep. Mom and dad praying. God supplied money for us to move in the car, rent a U-Haul trailer. A lot of it was miraculous, but I grew up just believing that's what God did. God miraculously provided And then when I was in third grade, I nearly died from very serious kidney disease. And the only reason I'm alive today is my parents' faith. They trusted God, and God answered prayer and healed me. A speaker challenged me as a teenager when he said, the world is waiting to see what God will do through a person who is fully yielded to him. Will you be that person? And I said, yes to God. I want to be that person. But then sometimes I would slip. And I was back again relying on my parents' faith. And then after I got married, my wife and I were newlyweds. My father and mother were visiting. And my dad said to me, Chris, he said, it's time you lost your parents' faith and got one of your own. I knew exactly what it meant. It was like an aha moment. I was like, 
Well, of course. Up till then, I'd kind of really leaned on my parents' faith, but now I had a family of my own. I had to trust God for my family. I had to step up. I had to trust Him and serve Him alone, or else I had to live for myself and worldly success. What would I do? What would you do? I chose to live for the Lord and follow Jesus, and I've never regretted it. Has it always been easy? No. No. Nothing is impossible with faith, right? Faith, but faith doesn't make things easy either, does it? But God always comes through. I believe the God I believed in, I have no regrets. So the first step to a real faith is that you must personally trust in God. The second step to real faith is you must act on your faith. You need to do something. You say you believe in God, that's great, but what if you completely depended upon God to keep His promise and act? The first time we do it is when we trust God to be born again. Because if God doesn't come through, right, nothing happens. And what does the Bible say? We have a promise. It says that if you confess with your mouth... Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Right? So we do that. We put our faith in God, and God saves us. That's the first time we step out in faith. Abram acted on his faith. The Bible says, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place, he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. Folks, there was no road atlases, no GPS, no rest stops back then, okay? But he left. You followed God. Will you put your faith into action like Abram did? Do you have a first chair, first hand faith? Or do you sit in the second or the third chair of faith today? Because remember, second hand faith is not real faith. Maybe, maybe you sit in the third chair, if you're honest. You've seen God work. He invited you to have a first hand faith. But like Jacob, you said later, if, if everything works out, then I'll trust you. Will you move today to the first chair of faith and put God first in your life? Will you follow Jesus today? He wants to forgive you. He wants to bring peace of mind as well as salvation to your heart. He wants to bless you. You say, well, how? What's the next step that God wants you to take in your life of faith? I don't know, but I'll bet you do. Do you need to come to Christ? Do you need to come back to Jesus today? To live for Him? Will you do it? Will you keep following Jesus? Parents, grandparents, will you help your children live by faith? Will you help them develop a real faith by showing them your faith in action? You say, how? Do you pray? Pray with your children. If there's a need, pray together for it. Something we did when our children were younger, we kept a prayer journal. We said, here's a request. We need a place to live. Let's write that down. We need tires for the car. Let's write that down. And then when God answered, we'd bring back the prayer journal and say, look, God answered today. Let's write that down. That helps children realize we have a prayer answering God. He's real. He cares for his children. Help them develop their faith. Explain how God is working in your life. Now, maybe if you're honest, you might say, well, Brother Becker, I'm just faking it. Going to church, singing songs, acting like a Christian. Like a one man said to me, He said, I'm almost a Christian. That's sad. He sang in the choir, but he had no faith in Christ. Are you almost a Christian today? So what about you? Are you living on someone else's faith? Which chair will you sit in today? Will you be satisfied with a third-hand or a second-hand faith? Because remember, second-hand faith isn't real faith in God. Or will you grab hold of God like Jacob did and say, Lord, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. Folks, I used to think that the Bible was about me and what I need to do. But one day I understood it isn't about me. It isn't about you. The Bible is about Jesus. It has salvation and what he has already done for us. Folks, we need to stop trusting in ourselves and what we can do and put our trust in Jesus Christ and what He's already done for us. Because you see, one greater than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is here. Consider this. Jesus is the true and better Abraham. 
who answered the call of God to leave the comfortable and familiar and go into the unknown to create a new people of God. Jesus is the new and better Isaac, who was not just offered up by his father on the mountain, but was truly sacrificed for us. And when God said to Abraham, Now I know that you love me because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from me. Now we can look at God taking his son up the mountain and sacrificing him at Calvary. And we can say, Now we know that you love us because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from us. And Jesus is the true and better Jacob who wrestled with God and took the blow of justice that we deserve so that we, like Jacob, only receive the wounds of grace to wake us up. Oh, friend, we come to Jesus today, not just to believe in him, but to trust him, to follow him, to obey him. He loves you. He always has and he always will. Amen? He always has and he always will. So will you turn from your sinful selfishness and say to God, Father, please accept me and adopt me, not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus Christ did for me, dying for my sin on the cross. If you will do that, the Bible says today, you can know for sure that you are a child of God. Let's bow our heads. Will you pray now and tell God what's on your heart? Christian friend, will you come back to Jesus today? Will you give up your idols? Will you believe the God that you say you believe in? Because we're called to love Him with what? All our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you can do it in the strength that God supplies. Difficult? Yes. But remember, faith makes all things possible, not just easy. Will you move to the first chair of faith today in your life? Right now, everybody is deciding what kind of faith they'll have. So let me ask you, which chair were you in when you came in today? Which chair do you want to be in? God has you here for a reason today. Maybe this message was for you. Is God calling you to change the direction in your life and move to the first chair of faith? It doesn't matter what chair you've been sitting in. You can step up today and be the man or woman that God is calling you to be. To be the godly husband, father, the godly wife and mother, the son or daughter that God wants you to be. Don't wait. The world is waiting. Your family is waiting to see what God will do through one man, one woman that is fully committed to him. Will you be that one? Lord, I pray today for each one of us here as we have heard your word that you would encourage us to grow in our faith, to move to that first chair of faith, to grab hold of you and not let go until you bless us, to be the example to our families that you've called us to be, to our neighbors, to live for you no matter what. Lord, I pray for those who are deciding to follow Jesus today, those who are struggling to trust you, Lord, that you will grant them the faith to do so. Thank you, Father, for all you have done for us, for the blessings that you provide, the peace that you give us, the mercy and grace that you bestow upon us. Even though we are not deserving of it, thank you for Jesus and his love. For we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.